So we're recording. Thank you. And live. Great. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, we are waiting for a couple more members to join. And right now we don't have a quorum. But hello to everyone. Um, hope you're enjoying this up and down weather. <laughs> I just put the fireplace on because it's freezing in here. <laughs> I don't know what's going on, but um, getting ready for 90 degrees. Um, we is so we're going to be um, we're going to have a couple of uh, somebody's calling me. What was that? Nobody. OK, um, a I couple of um, rather engaged on the list so we can um, officially start the meeting. OK, great. He he's coming into the panel. Yes. OK, great. And um, Reverend Mercer is not yet with us. Um, I believe he must be the call and yeah, he is with us now. We have okay. both here. Okay. Okay, great. Jared. Oh, yep. St. Paul's. Hi there. Hi, can you hear me? How are you? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I am. Let's see, something's going on in my I'll rename myself for one. <clears throat> Are you trying to go on camera? I was trying to both rename myself and go on camera, but. Oh no, you're, yeah, you're fine. So why don't, um, so but I don't you're, need to. okay, yeah, you're first on the agenda. So um, I know uh, we'd love to hear, you know, a, a brief over, overview, you know, five to 10 minutes about um, the status of uh, the families <clears throat> under your care. Um, and yes, you can introduce yourself just for the record. Um, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm Jared Mercer. I am the priest at St. Paul's Episcopal Church uh, on the high street. And um, just as Suzanne asked, I'll give a, a brief overview. I think a lot of people um, are, you know, well caught up with with much much of what's happening. Um, in December, we uh, welcomed our first Afghan family uh, in St. Paul's. So, working with the International Institute of New England, who is a resettlement agency in uh, throughout New England, um, and started welcoming Afghan evacuees uh, in the fall who were bouncing around uh, in different places and arriving in military bases um, in the U.S. Uh, throughout the fall. And then around November, December time is when they started uh, arriving in Massachusetts as their final destination. So Massachusetts has now welcomed around 2,000 and more uh, will be coming, um, though not in, in such mass quantities at once. So in December, um, I had been in touch for a few months with IINE, but didn't have a firm sort of answer of what was going to happen. Uh, but we had offered space in the church as temporary housing, because I know that was a need that they had, because finding housing for 2,000 people um, at once uh, is, of course, needless to say, an impossibility. And finding housing for such large families um, as we have here, so families of 9, 10, and 11, um, is, of course, proving to be a virtual impossibility. Uh, uh, no matter the timeline. And so uh, we welcomed another family at St. Paul's in January for a total of 19, two families and a total of 19 people. We were filled up at that point and so spoke with some other churches around and um, the uh, First Religious Society Unitarian Universalist Church on um, Pleasant and welcomed a family of 11 and then another family of three at Central Congregational Church. <clears throat> Since then, We've been working really diligently, of course, on housing, but also on just helping to support um, and sustain uh, every aspect of living. And you think about, we think about our own lives, everything from healthcare to education um, to everything in between uh, has, uh, there, there's just an immense need there. And we've had incredible volunteer support from our parishes, as well as from the, the surrounding community uh, to help meet those needs which are ongoing. Um, 
there's a lot of challenges, uh, including having no English upon arrival, um, and not to mention the immense amount of trauma and uh, that they've had to go through. And so uh, housing though is you near know, the top of the list of largest challenges that we're facing. We had initially a six month limit on how long the families could stay in the churches. They're obviously not, we're not zoned for housing, you know, we're, we're churches. Uh, and so we had that limit. Um, that limit is no longer with us, which is a great comfort. Uh, it gives us a bit of a cushion to figure out the best solutions um, because we are having to figure out creative solutions uh, for housing for these for these families. <clears throat> um, we started over these months, we've been working on different schemes. There are different options that we could think about. One, of course, would be just finding a market rental. We've done this for the small, the uh, Central Congregational Church has found a, um, an apartment for the small, the family of three. We always knew that that would be an easier thing to do. For the large families, um, straight market rentals are just simply not sustainable. We think about the kinds of jobs that um, they're going to be able to obtain with their with levels of English and, and everything else and being new to the country. And one that they are attaining now, actually, um, a couple of them have just started or are, are soon to start jobs and others have um, interviews coming. But the, the kind of income that's going to be generated from these given and, and then given the size of the families that need the support, um, it's simply not sustainable to go into. We have raised a, a lot of money. Well, well, a fair amount, and then they're going to receive another chunk of money from the state of Massachusetts going towards housing. But eventually, those chunks of, of funding run out. Um, you know, a year or two in, um, if you're looking at market rentals, and now, and, and I don't just mean in Newburyport. I mean anywhere. Right? It's just not sustainable. You know, central rural Kentucky, you know, would not be sustainable very long at market rates um, for these these families. Um, Another solution, so we've been trying to come up with, with, with creative ideas to make sense of this and to make this work. Uh, one of the uh, most promising is a partnership between various different, um, you know, the churches uh, with the families and uh, roof overhead um, project at the YWCA, the Affordable Housing Project Roof Overhead, uh, and the Affordable Housing Trust and the city's uh, housing authority uh, together um, playing their different roles uh, to make something to make to potentially make purchasing of of homes uh, a possibility that would be owned by the roof overhead project and rented uh, to the families at an affordable rate. Um, I I am. Uh, I've been really encouraged by the response of so many, including the Affordable Housing Trust um, and the city uh, itself and, and our mayor and so many others who are involved. I started in our in sort of housing group meetings that we have and, and even earlier in our sort of working group, which has people working on all different aspects of, of uh, assisting in this resettlement. Um, started throwing out ridiculous ideas that I thought was ridiculous, at least like when we're looking around at trying to find housing solutions, well, what if we could buy some or what if we could build on empty lots or what if we could do this? Expecting people to think um, it was just, you know, outrageous and stupid. And then um, incredibly people stepping up and saying, okay, well, let's think about that then <laughs> and, and trying to make it work, which is a really um, fantastic place to be in. I think in a very encouraging place to have such support from so many different angles, including members of the Affordable Housing Trust who have stepped up in incredible ways to be creative uh, with this. And John Fian at the Y, um, as well as uh, people in the city. And so we might just make the impossible possible, right? We might be able to just do the astounding and um, in doing so actually become the kind of society we want to become, which is one of love and embrace and welcome, one of equality uh, and diversity, uh, and one which can embrace those uh, who are in great need and who are extremely vulnerable and help them to flourish and um, have a sustainable way of life 
in this country having had to not only flee their own, but being taken from their own by us, right? By the US government um, and brought here uh, under the threat of death in their own country because of their association with and their assistance of ours. And so um, I think we have an amazing opportunity to um, uh, faithfully love and care for these for these people and to be and become the kind of people that we should want to be. And um, so I appreciate, you know, all the people involved who are wanting to make that that possibility happen. Thank you, Jared. That was great. Um, how uh, so the limits you said were lifted. Yeah. Um, so there are no limits, no longer limits at all, or? Um... Yeah, so that's, um, so yeah, the, the legal sort of limitation of six months was lifted. I think um, our aim is to get them in sustainable living situations as soon as possible that would be more, you know, mentally healthy for them and just a, you know, a better place for them to be. We will, so basically we're, I think we're moving to a model where we're able to be, you know, um, every so often inspected to make sure everything's still going okay or whatever and everything's still up to snuff and then are able to keep going rather than having a strict cutoff. Mm -hmm. Any uh, questions, comments, trust members or staff? I just have a question on their status. Um, is there a limit on that? Do we know if there's a date when they have to, something happens and they're no longer the same status as refugees? Yeah, so this is a real, this is a good question. It's also a really complicated one. Um, they don't have officially refugee status. And the reason that they have humanitarian parolee status and the reason they were given humanitarian parolee status is because refugee status takes years to achieve. And they would not survive years waiting to get into the country. It was an immediate need to get them in. Um, yeah, just absolutely immediately um, for their safety. So humanitarian parolee status uh, enabled that. What it didn't do is give them the benefits that refugees get. So in October, uh, there was a legislation passed which enabled them even under their humanitarian parolee status to get the benefits of refugees. Uh, and that includes things like cash benefits, uh, which is helpful of course, but not near enough uh, to survive on. And um, SNAP benefits that, you know, um, food stamps and things like that, as well as some other um, refugee funds that are one-off payments uh, for when they first arrived and things like that. So that was really good. The problem with that is there is still no permanent solution for their pathway to uh, permanent residency and citizenship, which they would have uh, in different ways under refugee status. There's a few different angles and what are ways that they can take potentially to get there. Um, some of the Afghan evacuees may qualify for special immigrant visas towards permanent green cards and citizenships. Others, uh, temporary protective status have been offered, but that won't work out so well, which is a pathway to asylum. And then uh, moving forward from there to permanent status, but that won't work out well for some regarding benefits and other things. So that's a complicated route to go. Um, the humanitarian parolee status does limit the amount of time, you know, that they are legal in the country but something will have to be done with that along the way. The problem is getting the federal government to do something, right? Um, but something will have to be done. They can't, obviously, at the end of sort of two years of humanitarian parolee status be sent back to Afghanistan. That would be a, I, I, think, our, I think our government would have to be put on trial um, at a human rights uh, tribunal if, if they did something like that. Um, so solutions forward need to be made to extend, to figure out the permanent status that they're going to be able to have, uh, but that's in process. But their current status is humanitarian parolee slash with the benefits of as if they had refugee status. Thank you for that. Any other questions, Madeline? Oh, yeah, yeah, I was curious, Jared. Um, 
uh, the status of your conversations with Habitat for Humanity. Um, I, I know it's a, a different model than what they typically use, but I, I think you've been having some discussions and I didn't know if there was any updates. Yeah, thanks, Madeline. So that's the other, so that's another, I think, really important um, and creative solution uh, as well, potentially, is working with Habitat Humanity in two ways. So one would be um, they've expressed, they're, they're, they've discussed with their board involvement, um, and though, because it's not the normal way that they work, um, and they are completely on board and wanting to help in any way they can, which is amazing. One way that they could help is if, say, through this process of acquiring property with grants from the Affordable Housing Trust and a Section 8 designation on a property, making it um, you know, affordable for the families and the property being owned by roof overhead. If there are repairs and things done, then that's a possibility of helping You know, if we can acquire a, a less expensive property needing repairs. That's been discussed. But the main way that we've discussed is um, there are plots of land uh, in Newburyport, which are residential plots which have never been built on, which the city owns for um, typically, it seems from, you know, sort of decades and decades of just it being abandoned and no taxes being paid. So the city um, taking ownership of, them, of these, these lots. So the, the scheme here would be would be similar, I think, to the scheme laid out by roof over with in conjunction with roof overhead, um, which they would then still own the property because um, uh, um, Habitat for Humanity does definitely doesn't do rentals, right? So this isn't the normal way in which they build or 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 you know um, construct houses for people on the one end, but it also isn't normal for them. And then indeed they never do rentals. So they would want someone else to be managing the property. Well, that would be roof overhead and then a plot from the city. Um, and then and then a building process. Now that obviously takes time that there would need to be a rental or something, you know, in the, in the meantime while that's being built. But that would be another way of going with hopefully the end result being, I would imagine being basically exactly the same, if not incredibly similar to the first scheme with ownership and the affordable housing um, project of roof overhead through the Y uh, and section eight designation on property for its uh, cost of rental if, if that's needed uh, for a new build um, with Habitat uh, helping to um, when the construction process, possibly in conjunction with uh, uh, commercial contractors, you know, other contractors as well to, to speed up the process or maybe just through Habitat. Great, thank you, Jared, for this update. Um, it's on our minds for sure. Um, and hopefully something will come together. Um, I appreciate the education. I think we all do about this the status and the limited status. I don't think I realize that. So um, thank you for that. So you're welcome to stay. Yeah, thank you, Jared. You're welcome to stay on or um, if you need to run. I think you said you had a game, but I don't know if the weather is <laughs> holding you back. So. Yeah. Well, all right. Kelsey, my, my wife actually got home from, from work earlier than expected. So she was able to take, <laughs> so I, uh, to, take the kids to soccer so I'm, I'm free but I, I do have to to get off and fix dinner for another child so <laughs> all right thank you so much for joining appreciate your time thanks okay great um so let's move on Tiffany I see that you're on welcome thank you um would love an, a quick update um from you I think we received the written um update but if you want to Take us through that that'd be great sure um i did provide a um an excel spreadsheet as well so i don't it sounds like um you didn't receive that but um we have assisted seven households to date um totaling including our um administrative part of it um just over nineteen thousand dollars um so that includes three elders six adults and five children um 
we are starting or we were starting to see the applicants slow down a little bit in the need. Um, I think because there was a real big push for um, raft that was wrapping up on April 15th. And we were also seeing a lot of raft applications being approved. So there was less assistance. Um, we did a few um, emergency applications um, in April and um, I'm happy to report that we actually avoided um, an eviction with a constable. So this money was greatly um, needed and used for um, a new report resident. Um, I'm not sure what the future holds. Um, there's a little bit of an uptick um, in COVID and you know this this variant that's out there. Um, so we are still, you know, providing um, awareness, talking. We had presented with the school nurse and um, some administrators that this funding is available. You know, working with our community partners um, to to really make sure that families are still aware there is still funding out there um, if needed. So, um, so we have just over um, five thousand left for rental funds for this specific COVID relief fund. Okay, great. Well, you know, it it gets used quickly, doesn't it? <laughs> when there's when it's needed. Um, are any questions for Tiffany in the group? So I, I have one, Tiffany. So in terms of sustainability, um, you said that um, that you, you don't know. Are, are these families sort of working toward a sustainable existence? Um, yes. Yes. Yep. OK. So right. yep, some are, you know, um, more getting um, back into um, a maybe different employment because they might have been in the restaurant industry and they just are fearful to go back or aren't still getting enough hours. Um, so yes, we're definitely looking at a sustainability um, as the as the long term goal. And you know, because we don't want to be providing um, all this assistance if they're not able to afford it beyond that. Um, right. So you know, looking at are they max like and also are they maximizing food stamps? Are they applying for um, other services as well that are entitlement services to them? So. Um, so yeah, it's not just they've applied, we're, we're looking at the full picture um, in all of their domains. Do they have health insurance in place? Um, you know, are they utilizing the food pantry? Are they utilizing more than one food pantry? Mm -hmm. um, so are, are they at the low income rate for utilities? So have they applied for fuel assistance? So we're helping with all of those um, areas. Wow, that's great. And you're so. Um, do who are your who's your um, primary or you know the the uh, the top two partner organizations that you work with? I, I'm assuming you don't do all of this on your own. Maybe you do. So it all depends on what you're talking about, um, <laughs> because you know there's the financial assistance side, and we have. We have our senior support program. So it's, you know, working with elders that are 60 and over. So it might be counseling on aging that we're talking about. Got it. Um, it you know, there's children and families. So it's working with schools um, and new report youth services and depending on what city or town we're talking about. So, um, and we do a lot of co-case management too. So if there's mental health and substance misuse, it may be working with Linkhouse and Center for Behavioral um, health for treatment or the, the hospital. So we have a wide um, mm -hmm. array of partnerships, um, uh, partnership members that we lean into for their expertise. So that, thank you. That's what I was yeah. looking for. I, yeah. I um, it, that's so incredibly um, important. And I'm so glad that you have good partners in the community. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Um, I, have, I wish to, oh, oh, go ahead. Okay. I, I just have a question on the remaining 5,000 um, in the fund. Yes. Um, you mentioned that RAFT has went away in mid-April. So um, the, the are we ERAP, nervous e, about that? So the ERAP funding is actually going away. RAFT is still existing, but it's going okay. to be at a lower amount. Um, okay. So we are also um, have applied for additional funding 
um, through the emergency food and shelter program, which can help with rent and mortgage. Um, we are running a campaign right now, um, Mission Possible through our agency to help with these um, emergency stabilization um, funding. Um, we also um, have other sources through some of our um, other programs, like we work with Newbyport Society for Re Relief of Aged Women. Um, so we do a lot of cost sharing, working with other like St. Vincent and Nepal, community actions. So, so yes, it's concerning because it is a housing crisis. And like the Reverend mentioned, market value rentals are really high and sometimes not sustainable for some of these families. So um, it is really looking at, um, you know, applying for um, public housing, getting them name, their names on the Section 8 list. So um, we are trying to keep them stabilized in, in their house. And that's why I said, like, looking at the overall picture, do they have um, all those other benefits in place um, to help sustain them um, as long as we can? And really working at the state level to see, like, is there some legislation moving around, you know, maybe more vouchers out there? Um, Cause I'm, I'm not quite sure who, what we're going to do um, if people are forced, forced out because they can no longer afford. Um, and, and, you know, obviously it's not just um, this area, it's across the nation, so. Thank you. Madeline, did you have a question? Well, um... I guess two comments. One is that, you know, I appreciate your efforts, Tiffany, at um, getting the word out that these funds are available. I would imagine that's always a challenge to make sure that people know that there are resources. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, and uh, I am a little confused about raft. I thought that the raft limit had increased um, but I think I just heard you say that it had decreased. So the, from what I understand, the raft limit was 7,000. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the ERAP was ending. Right. I remember when you first started working with us and you were saying one of the big challenges was that raft was just so bureaucratic. There was so much red tape and it was hard to get people the assistance that they needed in a timely fashion. Right, and then and they had more staff. So at one point they were helping up to like $20,000. So now it's it's saying 7,000 um, for rent and other housing costs, which could so include- it's gone some back income. down. Yes. It was higher, now it's gone yes. back down. Hopefully it will still be more accessible than it was before COVID hit. Um, and things have improved within the last, um, I'd say 60 days. We were doing a lot of advocacy and outreach um, because they had um, another agency that was helping and then they were having another housing authority and we were kind of confused of like who held the application for this specific client. So, um, but you know, it's <laughs> with, with a lot of persistence, you know, we got through, we had, um, we worked with a client, we had their um, app ID and, and some of it was just reassuring the landlord, like it is in process because it, you know, sometimes it was eight, eight weeks for it just to be assigned. And that's hard mm -hmm. for a landlord to kind of, you know, really wait on that decision-making. So, um, so, you know, Pet and Gill House social worker just calling and saying like, cause if we did the application, we could say firsthand, we have done it. And then, you know, and then if we hadn't, we could always follow up um, with the agency that held the application. And again, try to reassure the landlord that it, it was in process um, and kind of, you know, hold, hold in there with the, with the um, tenant, so. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful that you were able to prevent an eviction. That's, that's very. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. That's encouraging. Yeah. And then we have other funding to that because it, you know, it's not just rent, it's utilities and, you know, there are other things that they're behind. So we have other funding too that we can help um, kind of get the family back on their feet, get a payment plan set up that they can afford because um, it really is overwhelming. And we we want the families to start to move forward and feel empowered and, and that they can self-sustain moving forward. So 
it takes a lot of work and coordination, but, you know, so we're just asking the, the residents to, you know, be active participants and, um, you know, one step at a time, so. That's great. Um, while we're on this topic, um, what is the amount of our next, like, what is the um, approved amount for our next uh, iteration of emergency rental? Hi, Suzanne. It's Caitlin. It's Hi. Nine. Hi. It's 90000 Okay, good. Okay, great. Um, so we're going to need that soon, <laughs> right? Sounds like. Um, so that hopefully will we'll be able to um, launch that program very soon. Um, one more question, Tiffany, do you, are you um, getting any other requests outside of um, for COVID reasons, you know, so for like, for example, for this next round of funds that we have that we're hoping to launch very soon, do you have clients who would qualify for that? We do. Um, you do? Okay. Good. Yeah. We just had, you know, someone today that we helped with um, other funding that we still had available um, due to a health reason that they were um, out of work, they're recovering, um, and, you know, we're, we're falling behind. So, yes, there are definitely other needs, de definitely other areas that um, people need rent rental assistance beyond COVID. Good. Um, any other questions from the group? Tiffany, thank you for your time. It's a great report. Thank well, you, everyone. Great to hear. Great news, and not so great news, but hopefully we'll 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 get there, and we'll be able to help uh, a bit more in the days to come. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, who's taking on status of CPC? Hi, Suzanne, it's Caitlin. I can. Okay. Mar, Madeline, you're welcome to if you want to. Go for it, Caitlin. Okay, sounds good. Um, let's see. So the CPC voted um, to recommend to the City Council the full amount that was asked for, um, which is $230,000 for number one, the set aside of $200,000 for affordable housing development initiatives. And then also number two, 30,000 to be used for consultant services to update the housing production plan. Um, the CPC recommendations have been submitted to city council and they'll be uh, discussed at an upcoming city council budget and finance meeting on May 24th. Do we need to attend? Or is that um, typically not? Okay. Um, a lot of times applicants do attend and I'll be sending out a note about that. We do have the CPC vice chair um, that will be attending these meetings to answer questions about their recommendations. Okay, great. Well, we'll take that up later, decide who we should go. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, speaking of the housing production plan, um, Caitlin, since you're on, do you want to talk a little bit about the letter from the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission? Absolutely. Um, so we just received notice from the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission um, that they do, in fact, intend to apply for grant funding to update, um, you know, their communities in the valley, their um, housing production plans. Um, they're going to be submitting for two state grant applications um, um, to do this. Um, they should be, if they do get the funding, they'll be awarded November 2022, um, and they're anticipating being able to complete all of their communities' plans by June 2024, um, plus, you know, additional 90 days or so to get them through DHCD approval. Um, and my note to you all in the staff report was that's going to leave us with, you um, an eight month minimum gap in our approved housing production plan. Um, and so it may be worth a discussion um, what your thoughts are going with Merrimack Valley Planning Commission and their process or sticking with um, the consultant um, services that you applied for for CPA funding. I'm gonna let Madeline get us started on that conversation if that's okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, my um, 
recollection, because I was involved in both of the housing production plans, the one that, the first one that we did with a consultant, um, Karen Sonnenborg, and then the second one with the planning commission. Um, I thought both plans were excellent, but um, I personally felt that the city got more um, out of our process with uh, the consultant in that I felt like we got more individual attention for you know, the specific needs and issues of Newburyport. Um, and I, I just found that working with the consultant, both as our, as our housing trust, but also in our community meetings, uh, that it was just a, a more meaningful process. Um, so that would be my preference. Um, although I also, you know, support the efforts of the planning commission and I, I feel that it would be good to have that as a fallback because we don't know whether or not we're going to be successful in, um, you know, we, we would issue a request for proposals uh, for a consultant to work with us. We don't know what kind of a response we're going to get or what it would cost. Um, so I'd like to have the fallback of working with the planning commission. I mean, that was, I'm not trying to say anything negative about it. I felt that that was fine. I just preferred um, the first experience of working with the consultant. Um, so is the, um, the ask right now, Caitlin, for us to um, um, send a letter of support? That's right. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. whether or not we utilize them for our um, housing production plan is irrelevant, right? At this point in time. That's right. I don't think sending the letter of support means that we, you know, have to do it. It's just we're supportive of their grant application. Okay. Um, has everyone here had have have you reviewed both or have you seen either one of the housing production plans? Because um, I I don't recall if that was those were sent out, but um, I think that's a good exercise just to kind of familiarize yourself and look at both mm -hmm. kind of compare and contrast. And, and again, what Adeline uh, mentioned was the process, um, and I was around for both too, the process with the consultant was really more fulsome. It was really, you know, really they took, uh, you know, public comment into consideration. They took, um, you know, they talked to all of the stakeholders and, and that, um, that was really meaningful, I felt. Um, and really, especially at this juncture in the city, we really need to hear from everybody and every, we need to have everyone bought into this. So in that respect, I think, you know, we really have to take a good hard look at um, working with a consultant. That process is just very different. So any questions on the housing production plan? How long does the consultant take? How long did that first one that you did, Mandolin, how long did that take? I'm not sure, but I feel like it was probably about a six month process. Um, we, they did a lot of data gathering. I mean, we had developed a scope of services then we had a meeting with them to sort of tell them, you know, what we really wanted them to focus on. And then we had a follow-up meeting where we reviewed some of their initial data gathering and then we had a couple of community meetings um, at the library, I think they were. Um, and, um, you know, then they incorporated that feedback from the public into the plan. Um, so there were several steps, but I recall it's taking, you know, six to maybe eight months. Yeah, it takes a while. But, you I know, think I, I, I think I saw the most recent one, I think. You set that out when I joined. So if there's another another one, if I could have access to just look at that, it must be the consultant one that I didn't see. Yeah, we could take, you know, this can be, you know, we can have, I'm sure we still have it someplace. Yes, Caitlin, okay. Andy? The, 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 yes, the, we do. Okay. okay. We can okay. be on our website, but um, I'll make sure I send okay. out links to the whole trust. Yeah. Yeah, and that could be, this could be a more substantive conversation for another time, but um, for right now, 
Um, thank you, Madeline, for, for laying that out. Um, are there any other questions? I just want to be clear that we are, we are, do we need to vote on providing the letter of support or? Um, I don't think we need to have a, a vote for that. Okay. Just a standard form um, that they've okay. asked to kind of sign on. So I'll make okay. sure I do that and send that out to them tomorrow so they can include Newburyport in their grant application. Terrific. Thank you for that. Okay, where are we? Status of review. I think this is going to be a quickie. Who would like to take that from KP Law on our new rental assist assistance program? Uh, that's Andy. Uh, that's me. Uh, <laughs> sorry. So I, I have talked with our attorney at KP Law. He had asked for some additional documentation. I think he just wanted to make sure he was um, referencing uh, any applicable documents like the council order, not just the uh, housing trust request. Um, he's got the related documents uh, that were given in relation to the program, and we've asked him uh, to clarify if there's any adjustments you think are appropriate um, to make sure that uh, we maintain compliance with the CPA with respect to use of the funds, um, or if there's any additional documentation um, or, or details of the documentation that he feels that we should be including, or um, that way it's uh, sort of kept on the pile, if you will, in relation to the distribution of funds. So um, once he gets back to us on that, um, we can incorporate that. Um, I doubt that there'll be anything significant, frankly, uh, but um, it's uh, it's always good practice, I guess. So um, uh, hopefully he'll get back to us soon with any uh, suggestions of adjustments of anything, and we can then share that with the with the trust as well as Pat and Gil. Great. Do you have any sense of timeline? I'm hopeful that he'll get back to us next week uh, okay. or next week. Um, okay. I would not, unfortunately, expect that tomorrow. But uh, but I unfortunately because we've actually asked him to expedite a couple other things that might um, be sort of legally urgent. But uh, other than that, um, I do expect him to get back to us early next week because um, I don't think it's a heavy lift given the documentation they've got before them. So. Okay, good, great. Any questions on that from the group? Okay. Moving in, since you have the floor, would you like to give us a quick update on the Brown School? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I guess at this time, I'll, I'm actually speaking with the uh, City Council's Planning and Development Committee Chair tomorrow morning. Um, we're uh, going to be talking about setting the first date for the City Council's Ad Hoc Committee um, for uh, the Brown School uh, work. Um, and obviously there's a lot to talk about there. I know um, the trust has talked about uh, that property in different ways over the years. Um, and we have also talked to obviously a lot about that property with respect to NYS and uh, um, use for uh, retention of the gym space. So um, the uh, obviously the goal is to get the council together to talk about um, these different parameters. There is a um, uh, some uh, analysis is being done on the building and other studies. So there's been prior studies, of course, uh, one by Winter Street for housing, one by uh, Studio MLA, uh, focusing more specifically on NYS. And this uh, particular analysis is uh, a little bit more particular to the gym space itself, even if it isn't uh, for NYS. So um, there's a little bit of a slightly different focus of this particular analysis here, um, but it's the council looking for some additional information um, as to costs and um, adaptive reuse of the gym space uh, and focusing specifically on that. Um, so with that information, the hope is that um, uh, the committee will be able to work together and, and come to some policy consensus over um, the adaptive reuse of the school building, and that can inform every other um, step that may need to be taken after that. So um, I guess the question is when in the, in the coming uh, days or weeks will that first meeting be and, and kick that off? Obviously, the trust would have a role in, um, in assisting with its expertise and um, how the pros and cons of different parameters might relate to um, the viability of affordable housing uh, as a project there. Thank you. And for those, I don't know if we announced this at the last meeting, but um, Madeline and Karen Wiener will be representing the trust on the ad hoc committee. And so we will have a line item on our agenda for a report out uh, from Madeline or, and or Karen at each of our meetings, if that's okay. Just kind of keep us up to date. I see the windows are being done, Andy. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm happy to speak to that if anybody, did we cover that at all? I don't know if we ever- The grant, yeah, now the grant money. That yeah. we, we talked about it a few me couple of meetings ago, but I see okay. the work is being done, yeah. Yeah, um, so again, we weren't able to do quite as much work as we were hoping, but uh, but uh, to at least try to preserve um, the uh, one side of the, the building there, the windows get going on some of that work, um, utilize some state funding that was available um, in this particular you know narrow category, if you will. Um, and um, obviously, there's, there's be more to do there, of course, to convert that that property to housing if that uh, if and, and how that's uh, you know into the program. But um, this would at least reduce some of the cost for someone trying to renovate that that structure and make it into viable housing units. 
Thank you. Do we think we'll use up that the total amount of the grant by the June 30th? Uh, yes, uh, I do. And uh, we are essentially obligated to do so. So, uh, so yes. Thank you. Um, anything else on the Brown? Any questions? I can't, I'm looking forward to hearing about what's happening at ad hoc committee. So. Next yeah, time. I'm sorry. One thing I should note is um, I'm, I'm sure if you haven't already seen it, um, Caitlin, I'm sure we can grab that and just get it out to the trust. But the city council order that established the trust of the uh, ad hoc committee, um, just because that includes both the composition of the um, um, committee and the um, the charge that, that was given to the committee as far as the expectation of what they could do and circle back to the full council with. Um, and we plan on um, making sure that the uh, we have a page on the website. We plan on making sure that's fully up to date with um, relevant plans or reports have been done previously that are worth consideration. So uh, things idea. like the prior feasibility studies, uh, a couple of RFP responses we got from uh, folks doing uh, housing, uh, um, you know, a couple of uh, uh, 21E assessments or hazmat assessments of the property, just to kind of get an idea of what the issues are um, in adaptive reuse in the building or renovating it or cleaning up, uh, you know, things that are there that may not be needed going forward. So um, that contextual information for those who hasn't, aren't familiar with it, um, it would be sort of there on one, one web page you can kind of go to um, and any other resources that are coming could be sort of added to that. That's a lot of reading. <laughs> it is, and I, I don't uh, wish it on anybody who, because I've seen some of them so I can kind of skim through it a little easier for me, but um, I, I don't wish it on anybody that has to read through all of them collectively. <laughs> Oh, well, that's a great idea, though, to have that a project site like that. Thank you for that. So um, what we'd like to do, we kind of talked about this a little bit, is that we'd have a, a topic for each of our meetings. Today, obviously, um, Reverend Mercer spoke to, and brought us up to date on the Afghan families and the housing situation. And so for our next meeting, we would like to hear about short-term rentals, um, what's happening with all of that and um, the impact on local housing costs. Um, so we will tee that up. Um, I may need some help um, from the planning office to make sure we have the right folks um, joining us for our next meeting, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess I, and Caitlin jump in here as well. I, I would um, just note that I guess in terms of, um, I, I do agree that there's, a, um, there's an impact, if you will, on ver in various different ways. Um, um, one segment of the housing market can impact others. And so, um, you know, store term rental units can have an impact on the little a affordable units that are in the community, essentially. Um, and I think that most people, you know, in, in our area of work would, would acknowledge or agree with that. Um, what I don't know is the extent to which that is a factor in the larger market, because there are so many larger forces affecting those costs. Um, and those issues. So it, it is a factor there. What I don't know is what, uh, how we could, uh, this office could provide, um, you know, definitive information on the, the level of impact there uh, right now, but uh, we certainly can recommend um, folks that should be brought to the table for that discussion. It certainly is um, one reason for regulating um, the, the quantity, if you will, of short-term rental units in the community. Great. Yeah. I'm, it's, it's really, it's a, it's not just a hot topic here. It's happening everywhere. I think the city of, uh, I don't know if it's a city or a town, Newport, Rhode Island actually just, um, are re they're really restricting Airbnb in their downtown area. Um, and, and Nantucket as well, I think I've heard. So, um, so this is really, really something that we need to focus on. Um, this new terminology, just if, in case you haven't heard this, Madeline, you've probably heard it in others, this uh, NOAA, Naturally Occurring Affordable Housing, has caught the attention of our uh, regulators, uh, specifically the OCC, FDIC, and the Federal Reserve. Um, in the rewrite, the moderniz modernization of the Community Reinvestment Act, which is what all banks have to adhere to and making sure that they're uh, providing um, lending and services to low and moderate income populations in, in the communities where they do business. Um, NOAA is going to take on a new meaning and, and I'm hoping that we see more uh, lenders stepping up to preserve no, you know, naturally occurring, affor naturally occurring affordable housing. So um, to the extent that we can identify uh, some of those uh, buildings here, um, that would be really, 
really great. I know there are not many, but there are still a few out there. So, um, you know, maybe something for us to, to think about going forward as it relates to um, sort of a, this new sort of hot button issue uh, in the financing world. Um, okay, um, other planning office updates that you'd like to raise and anything from anything else, Madeline, that you wanted to talk about? Nothing from me uh, that I can think of right now. <laughs> uh, this is Caitlin. I don't have any other updates besides you know what I included in your uh, staff report. Um, we do have that roof overhead proposal. I'm not sure, Suzanne, you wanted to bring that up during yeah. your yeah, do we yeah. vote on that or we, we did vote on it in theory. Um, John Fian presented us with a letter that's in the packet, I believe. Um, we are, uh, so I'm just gonna, I'll just throw this out there. So when we originally voted to approve that, um, we had a property in mind. There was a, there was a deal, right? That was in, in play. There was a, a, a property in play. I, you know, and, and this is, you know, I want to say this as gently as possible, but, and I'm being a little conservative here. Um, I apologize. This is my, my, my underwriting lending self um, that we really cannot um, approve funds uh, in a, in a speculative way. Like we need to see what the, what the terms and conditions are, what the prop, where the property is, how much work needs to be done, right. et cetera, et cetera, right? So it, it would be, we need to be good stewards of our um, funds. And so my recommendation is that we, um, we take this up as a group when there's another property in play, if one comes. Um, so I'm gonna leave that there and let you guys react to that. It's, um, but that's what I think the right thing is to do. Yes, yeah, Suzanne, I think I agree with you. The other thing, um, like I, I support the Afghan family initiative. Um, on the flip side, like our, our church did the same thing. We resettled settled an Afghan family, but we had to move them to Somerville um, because that's where the community was and that's where the housing was. And even when we tried to settle a family in Reading, they all moved pretty quick after we settled them to be with their other members. And I'm friends with Jared's. So I really appreciate what he's trying to do. I'm not convinced Newburyport is a place to resettle Afghan families permanently. And, and purchasing housing specifically for them um, could be short-sighted because they're not likely to stay. Maybe they will. And I think it's a good thing. Like I support it. It just, it's, it's a little bit complicated. So I've had some experience resettling and they move um, cross country and everywhere else pretty quick once they can uh, get grounded a little bit which I don't blame them. They want to be with family and with larger communities. Um, that's really interesting, Brian. Uh, I was going to say that um, I think, like Suzanne said, at our last meeting, we um, showed our support for the concept of making some of our funds available. If, if a if a project or property or an acquisition or whatever it is um, becomes you know, tangible, I think we're, we're in agreement that we're supportive of these efforts, but I, I think we need a lot more information uh, before we actually commit dollars to a specific acquisition or whatever it is. Again, you know, it might not end up being an acquisition. It might be something different, but um, I was just going to say that if time is of the essence, and that's what um, John Fian was getting at in his letter, we have as an entity um, done votes uh, via email. Um, you know, if we don't have a meeting scheduled really soon and, you know, there's this timing crisis, there, there is a way, a mechanism for us to act um, through the planning department, you know, sending us an email that we can then respond to electronically. So I think we have a way to um, you know, be responsive without uh, responding to this uh, specific request from John Fian. Yeah, this is, um, 
yeah. So, Mia, do you have any? Uh, I don't know no, if you I can deliberate. You, okay, yeah, okay, I okay, okay good. Vote on the thing, so, but, okay. but I, I feel the same way, I think we, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Yep. Bob, do you have any um, feedback? Anyway, I just want to make sure we're all where we feel all good right. about that. Okay, all right. Maybe okay. also we need to explore better because every time I see something from the churches, it seems like they're trying to um, that they would love to have them in our community. I think we all would love that, right. but I don't think we really understand. We haven't heard directly from the families. Uh, maybe they have. I just don't know. So I think Madeline's. Um, or Brian's input is very valuable in just really understanding um, what it is they they would like, what kind of, where would they like to live? Thank you. Bob, were you trying, I'm not sure your mic is working. I think I see I'm you're working. unmuted. Okay. I'm, I'm, there you are, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm back. <laughs> you're back. Yeah, um, no, I, I agree with them. Um, Brian, that it, it's a it's a it's a problem coming into this country, and settling, and then having the opportunity to get together with your peers in a community where you can share and have a, a critical mass yourself, and that's very important. And so it's hard to get them to stay in Newburyport. I agree with Brian. Yeah, I think that the the. Um... Thank you for your comments, both of you. Um, I, I think also we need to, I mean, this is really a roof overhead um, comment, that this, this humanitarian resettlement home, whatever we want to call it, would be, you know, families would cycle in and out depending mm -hmm. on need, right? So it wouldn't be necessarily for one family to stay permanently, but as we ex as we welcome uh, new families, um, we'd have a place for folks to live. So, I think that would be a great value, and that's yeah. Yeah. having a place. No matter Afghanistan, Ukraine, whatever, right. there's a place to not a church basement. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, hey, Dan, I just say that there's someone in the attendee list that has their hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I I haven't seen that. Um, do you want to? Yeah. Um, name is Marianne. Hi. Um, I really wanted to reiterate the point that uh, Suzanne just made, um, and Brian, you made a great point that, e and Mio, that even though families say they want to be here now, they're in such a stage of settlement that it's so hard for them to know what their long-term needs and plans are. Um, and whether or not they will connect with other people in their communities. Um, but I, the point that Suzanne made is, I, I think, important that there's, a, I think, hopefully a more of a community commitment to resettlement housing and that that is hugely valuable. Thank yeah, you. good point. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. <laughs> awesome. Okay, anything else for the good of the order? We're gonna do, a, I think we can approve minutes. I'm not sure. Um, Suzanne, and I was just looking at that. We need Kim here to do that. So okay. we need to table these for the next meeting. Okay, <laughs> we're always tabling minutes. Someday they'll be approved. Um, <laughs> wonderful. Okay, let's talk about next meeting date. We are right on time, folks. 659. Um, I would love for us, um, hopefully things will improve, although they're not, we're not doing really well in the COVID uh, sense right at the moment, but um, I would love to see your beautiful faces around the table, a nice big table with, with the windows open if need be. Um, so I'm hoping that could potentially work for June. Any, um, are we, so is this, is this going to be budget and finance meeting night forever, or is it just this one? Um, I took a look through the calendar. It looks like, um, you know, budget and finance is meeting pretty heavily, you know, over the next, you know, yeah. months or so. Um, but after that, you know, our, our meeting date doesn't seem to really coincide with too many of those. So. Oh, good. All right. Terrific. Um, so can you give us a couple of options? Yep, so I was looking, um, 
I see, you know, June 30th or uh, uh, July 21st as potential dates. June 30th, wow. <laughs> um, it feels such, like such a long time from now, but I guess that's okay. Is that all right with everybody? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Okay with me. And I agree, sure. Suzanne, it would be great if we could meet in person. So let's just see if that's possible. Yeah. I'll even bring food. <laughs> I, that's how much I want to see you. <laughs> Gluten free for some of us. <laughs> anyway, all right. Awesome. Did Marianne, is your hand still up from before or did you have another question? Oh, there it goes. Okay. <laughs> Just checking. All right, folks. Um, we'll have an awesome evening. Great meeting. Lots of good information. Um, we'll see you all in just over a month. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a good night.